Welcome to Baseball and Coffee, episode 23, um, with Tino and Aaron. Aaron, what's up? What's going on? Not too much, man. Trying to keep my chin up. Feel, feeling about this tall right now. Because of your fantasy team? Yeah. I feel like uh, this game, this hobby, whatever we want to call it, can be really humbling sometimes. And uh, I'm just looking forward to talking to you, honestly, and getting out of my own head. <laughs> cool. <laughs> because it's... It's cathartic. It's needed. So, right. Uh, yeah, you kind of get in isolation, just day to day grind. So, yeah, I'm just trying to be positive, trying to keep it, keep it up. Right on. You got any uh, any coffee stories for today? I got a doozy for you. So, um, I work nights, as we talked about. So, sometimes I get really tired on my way home, and I get I feel unsafe behind the wheel. So, I'll stop and um, I'll get a coffee at a gas station. Shout out, Matt. Um, uh, who I always think of when I stop at the gas station to get coffee, and it's terrible coffee. It's like a uh, Reuters or Sheets, mm-hmm. and, I'll get, and I'll get a decaf, and it tastes awful, but it's hot, and it's like hot coffee-tasting water. <laughs> That's funny. And it helps keep me awake, uh, basically, because just having a hot drink and sipping and just doing something besides just sitting behind the wheel. Right. So anyway, kind of lights me up, even though it's decaf. Today, I stopped, and... I immediately I tasted it, it had like flavor in it you know and it's one of those like long line of shuttles at the gas station right? and they have all different flavors some of right. them are flavored it was clearly flavored and I didn't really care about that it wasn't so much I was offended by the flavor even though whatever I don't flavor my coffee I drink black mm-hmm. it was that I probably knew it wasn't decaf and I knew it would disrupt my sleep if I had caffeinated coffee sure so I go back in I tell them hey this is flavored coffee i want a decaf is there i could get a decaf she tries to tell me it's not she's like oh no that's decaf and she tastes it she's like oh that's decaf i was like okay well i'll just take a refund anyway right. i ended up brewing it for me again and it clearly was different i'm 100 percent certain it was flavored and i was just like i wanted to tell her listen i'm not trying to be rude i taste coffee for a living this, <laughs> right. is, flavored, this is flavored coffee <laughs> uh please I, i'm not trying to be difficult she's like yeah anyway i just want I, I had this moment of ego where i wouldn't be like you know who i am <laughs> of course i didn't say that that's funny well but, uh, yeah, and there's me. but there's like big ramifications for serving um serving caffeinated coffee and advertising as decaf right there's like legal ramifications for people who are allergic to caffeine. Yeah. Hey, gas station or not. Honest mistake. And uh, except I know what their decaf tastes like because I've done this probably five or six times when it's needed. Right. And, uh, yeah. And I know what flavored coffee tastes like. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, mine is, is less exciting uh, depending on how you look at it. I was digging through um, some of my storage and I found my uh, V60. So I think V60 is going to be the uh, first kind of alternative pot of coffee, um, brewed pot of coffee um, brew method that I'm going to go with. And so I've ordered some filters. Of course, I went through the age old uh, debate as to order, whether to order the white filters or the um, the natural filters and whether the white filters actually impact the flavor of the coffee. And, but I'm super excited to, um, to make a V60 and, and get back on the horse. So that should be fun. I also found my, um, AeroPress, but I don't have any AeroPress filters and I've, I've never really been a big fan, Mm. but see, we'll start that. We're going to start that, uh, that alternative brew method adventure again. Awesome. Should be fun. All right, so today we're going to go through a couple of player deep dives, one hitter, one pitcher, talk about some waiver pickups that might be on the wire uh, in a 15-team league. And if we have time, we're going to go have a little bit of a prospect chatter. So who was your first hitter that you decided to do a deep dive on? Um, I took a look at Hassan Kim. Huh, okay. Um, and the reason I did that is, honestly, he's a player that I really like, and he had a great night last night. Um, he's having a good year, and I think it's interesting to look at, um, given the light of, like, two players, I was thinking about him in terms of, like, C.J. Abrams, mm-hmm. who has a longer-term ceiling, um, who he was competing for at-bats with, and Abrams got sent down this week, mm-hmm. and I was also thinking about him in 
in relation to Saya Suzuki, who's really um, slowed down after like a great start. Um, because I think it's interesting to look at players as they develop, you know, and in his case, transitioning from the KBO. And as I mentioned, he's one of my favorites. And this goes back to experience, you know, as we talked about in the pod when, during the pandemic, Tino and I would stay up late and watch the KBO. And Ha Song played for the Kiwum Heroes, were, who became my favorite team. They had a, a left fielder by the name of uh, Jung Ho Lee, uh, who reminded me a lot of like King Griffey type swing. Um, uh, and he's really dynamic and I loved Ha Song Kim as well. So anyway, he came over last year, you know, as we all know, uh, in the fantasy circle, he really, um, there was some, a little bit of buzz around him. Great play skills, great speed, plus defense, had good power in the KBO, but um, he struggled in transitioning to the majors. Um, looking at him this year, um, what I saw is that he uh, is really doing a lot better against fastballs. Um, so I looked at him specifically as performance gets four seamers and two seamers. So last year there were four pitch types. He had a negative run value against this year. It's only two um, and they're just negative one. So he's really improving. And then the four seam and the sinker specifically, he's went from a negative seven run value on the four seam to a plus four. He's actually performing really well against the four seam. His, his uh, ex woba on the four seam has gone from 298 excuse me, 289 to 403. And his X slug on the four seam is over 298 to 585. Um, so he's adjusting to velocity. Um, the other thing that I saw is that he is swinging less, chasing less. Um, he already had a great chase rate, but he's improved it even more. But he's swinging at first pitches less. And then when he gets the ball in the middle of the zone, he's swinging more. So he's seeing the ball better when he gets his pitch. He's swinging at it. He's not missing it. Um, so swing decisions. I think these are all things that I wasn't necessarily surprised to see. I, I believe he had the talent. Um, certainly, again, KBO is more considered like a double A level. But I really believe he had the talent. And it just has taken him more time than you know we would have liked in, in this super fantasy to see him completely come around. Um, yeah, I just... Um, I really encourage about what I saw and it's interesting to look at it from a player development perspective, you know, and then in terms of the context, his position right now, he has um, like the 13th best OPS at second base. So in our league, he's would be considered a starter by that metric. Um, he's outperforming uh, Jake Cronenworth on his own team. Well, I think I was a little higher on than you were, but he had a great year last year. Um, he's quietly over um, or outperforming him as well. So yeah, he's just, uh, he's off to a really good start. He's a really great defender. So I'm really interested to see as the season rolls on what his role becomes once Tatis comes back. Obviously, Tatis is probably the primary short step. They also played outfield. Um, so it'd be interesting to see, um, do, do they split time at shortstop? Does he go to the outfield? Does he go to the bench? Um, you know, they just signed Robinson Cano. I don't think that affects him. Um, yeah, he's slashing 220, 224, 340, 435. Uh, four homers already, se uh, seven barrels, uh, sort of 12% barrel rate, which is really uh, quite good. Um, and his K to walks is 20 Ks and 13 walks. So a very, uh, really good plate skills, which is one of the things that I valued about him. So that's what I found. Um, and that's what I wanted to share about him. I wonder if, if we should just be applying like a year transition to uh players that play in korea mm -hmm. you know because the obviously the the japanese league is a little is slightly um more advanced and i think with with a player like suzuki who i would also argue is probably slightly more talented um it might not be a full year but a player like him you know it's that's a huge transition right we don't expect players to go from if double a is the only thing they've seen unless they're an elite talent it's not necessarily uh an easy transition. So no, that's super cool. I know you traded for him recently and he was a player you rostered last year. Um, I am interested to see what happens uh, with his playing time once Tatis comes back as well. I could see them playing him at second and then making Cronenworth the uh, kind of that super utility player that he that he's been in the past. Also, if Grisham doesn't start kind of getting his shit together in center field, um, you might see somebody transition towards center field. So I don't know. I, I expect Tatis to be installed back at short. Um, if it was me, 
I might think about playing him in center field a bit just because it would protect his his wrist a bit and um, and whatever other injury shoulder that he had last year uh, by playing center field and, and maybe reinstall him at shortstop in 2023. But if Kim's hitting the way he's been hitting the last, I don't know, month or so, I think we'll we'll see him get regular playing time uh, regardless of whether, you know, when Tatis comes back. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to push it too far down the line, but I mean, he has their third best WRC plus, you know, on the team right now. Um, and so, yeah, it's the, and the Padres are not tearing the cover off the ball. I mean, Manny is doing amazing so far. Right. There's out over his skis a little bit, but by and large, the under the, the lineups underperformed. So yeah, to your point, um, yeah, just all the machinations of, Obviously, Tatis is um, the leader of that team, and, and both from a stature and a performance standpoint. But how do you how do you not find a bats for someone who's a plus defender and at this point is one of the three or four best hitters based on runs created so far? When your lineup is not knocking the cover off the ball, right? I I also it wouldn't surprise me to see him get some time in, as a corner outfielder as well, mm-hmm. given you know the kind of Will Myers type players they've been running out there recently. <laughs> So my deep dive was uh, Andrew Vaughn, who is a player that I have loved since he was drafted, um, loved his profile, rostered him in a number of leagues, uh, did trade him in during the offseason, essentially for um, Zach Wheeler. And uh, I, can't, I can't say that I regret it because I'm excited to have Wheeler, but Vaughn is a player that I, I still think is going to be um, really dynamite. So he's six feet, 215 pounds. I doubt that he's even six feet tall, 24 years old, was drafted third overall in the 2019 draft out of uh, Cal Berkeley, grew up in California. Uh, I found it interesting. I went through the top 10 in the 2019 draft. Um, Rutschman went first, Witt went second, uh, Vaughn went third, JJ Bladé was fourth, uh, Riley Green fifth, C.J. Abrams, sixth, uh, Nick Lodolo, seventh, Josh Young, eighth, Josh Young, sorry, eighth, Shay Langoliers, ninth, and Hunter Bishop was 10th. Um, other notables were Alec Manoa at 11, Corbin Carroll at 16, George Kirby at 20, Daniel Espino at 24, Anthony Volpe at 30, and Michael Bush at 31. Uh, so Vaughn is, was considered a little bit of a risk in that he was a right-handed um, hitter that was going to hit for good average, great hit tool, um, lots of power, but he wasn't playing anything but first base and DH. As we know, when he came up last year, they played him as a corner outfielder, which they thought maybe it impacted his um, ability at the plate a bit, learning a new a new uh, position. So he had only had 245 plate appearances um, in 2019 before his debut in 21. Uh, in 21, he hit uh, Triple slash of 235, 309, and an OPS of 705 with 15 homers. Um, he's considered a 70 hit tool guy. So, um, and 60 power. So he's certainly has power, but his hit tool is the carrying tool for him. Uh, this year so far, 283, 367, 933 OPS with four home runs. So his launch angle is the same this year as last year. His numbers are better, obviously. Yeah. Um, launch angle is the same, but his ground balls are down uh, about 5%, and his fly balls are up about 7%. So he's getting some more loft on the ball, and he's still hitting it really hard. Um, I found that he's pulling the ball over 10% more than he did last year. So he's getting the ball in the air. He's hitting it to left field. His O swing is down quite a bit. Um, looks like about 5%. So he's swinging at fewer pitches outside of the zone. His O contact is way up. So it was 61.4% in 2021. So contact on pitches that were outside of the zone, it's 83.3% this year. So all of these things to me, and his contact rate is is up uh, almost 8%. And swinging strike is down almost 4%. What does all this mean? To me, it's like all right, maybe he opened his eyes, right? Maybe mm-hmm. he got a better a better uh, prescription for his contacts. Like there's so much in terms of his pitch recognition and his ability make, to make contact that has changed um, last year versus this. 
and he wasn't horrible last year. It's not like he struck out a ton, mm -hmm. but he's, he's showing that he's has the potential to be a 300 hitter with power, right? If he's able to continue to hit the ball hard, continue to pull the ball and make the kind of contact that he does, um, things are really, really looking up for him. Um, the other interesting thing that I found is that he's a dead red fastball hitter. So, uh, he is hitting 286 with the 536 slug against fastballs currently. His XBA is 413 against the fastball, and his X slug is 876 against the fastball this year. And his batting average and slugging are similar this year than they than they were last year to the uh, against the fastball. Um, so he's a dead red fastball hitter. The one thing that I found with Andrew Vaughn that caused was cause for a little concern is that his, uh, granted is pretty small sample size, about what, 15% of the season, 20% of the season. His average exit velocity last year was 91.1 and this year it's 89.2. So he's hitting the ball a little less hard on average, but he's hitting it to the right places. Um, I think eventually he's gonna hit, I would assume he hits third behind Moncada in the White Sox lineup eventually. I think that's kind of the right place for him and they move um, or maybe, I guess maybe fourth behind Luis Robert, uh, but he's going to hit top five in that order. It's going to be a great offense. I think he's a perennial, um, 290, 30 home run, 100 RBI type of guy. And I think eventually he'll slide right in there for Abreu and potentially be a better hitter than Abreu. But I was really excited about what I found with Andrew Vaughn. And he's a player that even though I don't roster him anymore, um, we do, we roster him in, yeah, is we do. In uh, NFBC, is that right? No, uh, TGFBI. TGFBI. Um, he's, I'm, I'm still very, very confident in him and uh, an exciting player for me to watch. Okay. What, have, what have you found with Vaughn or what have you seen with Vaughn as you've watched, him, watched the White Sox play? Yeah, I, I'm encouraged as well. The increased pull rate, I think, is big. Um, as you said, his profile coming up was not absence of power, but not that super high raw power raw power ceiling mm -hmm. but his hit tool was such that you know uh, there was a belief that he could grow into that and pulling the ball for him is going to be an important part of that so seeing that change I think is important for fantasy um, to see that because that full power is again going to be big for him and yeah just the improved swing decisions to me I never lost confidence that he was going to do that he really didn't he really skipped almost from the college to the pros. I mean, because of the pandemic and, and I just don't think there's that many to expect someone to be completely successful the first go around with that being this, the case. It's just not realistic. Um, and you need to throw in the variable of what they did with him position wise, you know, and I think what we talked about in the preseason was a is splits, which is splits look really good. He's still crushing lefties, but his, his uh, slash on against righties is very good as well. So there's not a discrepancy. And then the other thing was like, what would they do with him position-wise? And um, that was my other concern of not giving him a defensive home and just letting him hit. Um, and he's doing a better job adjusting to that. So those are my concerns coming in. But I, I don't think he's doing anything from a swing decision or play, play discipline point that I didn't expect. And to me, he's just a talented hitter who's finding his footing um, given more time. And I, I hear what you're saying about the exit velocity, but to me, that, that could just be like, two or three pop-ups that's affecting that because the sample is so small. I mean, I'm actually, his barrel rate is up. He already has six barrels in 44 events. So that's really good. Um, I, I love to see that. Where, how far up do you push him in uh, first base fantasy ranks? Like dynasty ranks? For dynasty, I think mm -hmm. for me, I mean, there wouldn't be, he would definitely be in the top five or six for me without having names in front of me and just, off the cuff mm -hmm. I can't think of anyone who's coming immediately that I'm more interested in like from uh, who's in the high minors right now who I would value more and or so it really comes down to the young first baseman they're already up um, just because plate skills and hit tool are, I just um, for me are such important tools right yeah I was trying, after off the top of my head I was you know do I take him over obviously not Vlad right. um, do you take him over Olson Ooh. Do you take him over uh, Alonzo? Do you take him over Freeman? You know, 
who else is in that range, right? Who's five? Who's six? Goldschmidt. Um, no. Honestly, Torkelson. I would put him ahead of Tork for for right now. Mm -hmm. I think I mean, between the jump he has on development wise, they have I think pretty equitable hit and plate skills, and he has a better lineup and ballpark context. Um, and you might have a little bit edge in terms of batting average. Torque might have a little bit more raw power, but they're pretty close. But I think, again, he's a, a year ahead of him in development and he plays in a better team context. So it would be very, very uh, close to me. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah, I, I think, honestly, I, I think, go ahead. Yeah, I think Alonzo and uh, Alonzo, yes, I would keep over him. And I think Olsen as well. Um, but I think when you get down to the Goldschmidt, and Freeman, that's where I might in a year push him above those guys. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it's it's obviously Vladdy won, but then I'd probably put Von Torkelson tied with at, at two mm -hmm. and pick one of the two based on which profile you prefer, right? Do you want more power? Do you want all the power or do you want more of the hit tool with some power and better context? Um, and then I'd probably put Olsen and uh, Alonzo, probably Olsen three, Alonzo four. And then the older guys kind of fill in that, that uh, five, six, seven range. But it's interesting because that's not where we had Vaughn preseason, right? I think we wanted to put Vaughn higher than we actually did, each of us. Yes. But he just, we just didn't know if he's going to be able to hit right-handers. It was kind of 60, 40, 60 being, okay, he's going to develop into a really good player. And 40 being he might end up being a a small side platoon first base DH type, right? Um, yeah, for me, it's about like what do you have the opportunity to hit righties? What do you have right. the opportunity to find a defensive home? What do you have opportunity to get his footing and play every day? Right. But I yeah, I I like him a lot. I think he's a really dynamite hitter and probably gonna be a, a fixture in that White Sox lineup for the next eight years or so, I would assume. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, I don't, I mean, we've we've seen organizations like I don't want to say ruin, but really kind of diminish the really talented prospects by moving them around and injuries and right. you know guys like Sinzel come to mind or you know, and I'm not making a comp in terms of their talent, just throwing a name out, but he was a top five type pick. Who they've changed his position three or four times, he's had injuries, so you just it's murky. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm just really uh, pleased and not surprised again, but just happy for that we're seeing that. Right on. So who's your pitcher? My pitcher is Pablo Lopez. Um, nice. He, uh, timely, he, he had a great start last night against the Brewers um, and went had 20 swings and misses. And, you know, he's someone that I consistently kind of overlooked. I think when I looked at my preseason ranks, um, I had him in that sort of uh, command over stuff range, uh, good ballpark, uh, good, good pitching team. But knowing he wasn't getting a lot of wins. And fittingly, last night, the bullpen gave up his lead. He didn't get the win. As an Alcantara owner, I know all about that. Um, that is the path for, for those starters, as good as they are. But I just felt like I was maybe not giving him this full deuce. I want to spend a little bit more time on him and see what, what is making him so good. Um, early on here, he's in the National League. He's first in ERA, third in batting average again, third in batting average again, third in whip. Um, fourth in innings pitched, eighth in Ks, and ninth in K minus BB. Uh, so he's in the top 10 in K minus BB, BB which is a stat uh, that we really look to a lot here. Uh, he's at 25.5%. Um, um, I just, first I looked at some comps. So um, Savant, um, pitchers who have similar arsenals and velocity movement, Alec Manoa, Merrill Kelly, Spencer Turnbull, Steven Strasburg. So this is, uh, again, just trying to familiarize him with what type of pitcher is he. Uh, I thought that was an interesting comparison to think about, especially in Manoa, who we think of quite highly. Um, they operate at similar velocities. Um, I think we think of Manoa as more dynamic, or at least I do. So kind of questioning my own bias there. So his uh, arsenal, he throws four pitches. But really what I found is he's a fastball changeup guy. Um, and really what makes him dominant when he's going well is his changeup. Um, his his changeup already has a negative eight run value, which is far and away um, number one in the MLB. 
Um, last night against a fastball hitting team, he threw it 44 times and he got 14 of his 20 swings and misses on the pitch. Um, so he's, um, and, and as what I did is I watched, um, I watched all 11 strikeouts. MLB had a, a feed where you could watch all 11 of his Ks and uh, eight of them came on that pitch and none of them were in the zone. Uh, I just watched pitch after pitch. That's not true. There were two that were in the zone. So he's getting swings and misses outside the zone. Um, his four seam uh, has below league average spin and velocity. And so it's, it was just interesting to see someone who, and maybe that's part of the reason why, you know, in the sort of spin centric, savant centric, maybe that's part of the reason why I overlook him and there's a bias on my part is he doesn't have that spin, doesn't have that velocity. Um, it was just interesting to me that his fastball performs as well as it does given those characteristics. What I determined was he's just able to keep people off balance because his changeup is so good um, that they're off time. Because if, if they knew the fastball was coming, giving its character and shape, they should be crushing on it, and they're not. He actually had a positive run value on the fastball last year, and he does again this year, just again, despite it having below average characteristics. Um, but again, his changeup is far and away number one. I did a quick study um, just looking at the top, uh, top five changeups in terms of swing and miss this year, he was far and away number one. The other four, just for interest, were Zach Davies, Kyle Hendricks, uh, Sandy Alcantara, and Ian Anderson. But Pablo was well ahead of the others. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's 54, he's gotten 54 swings and misses on the changeup, and 35 of them have been out of the zone. And then 15 other of the other 15 of the other 19, 15 of them were in a lower third of the zone, so at the bottom of the zone. He's only thrown four that were in the middle of the plate out of 54 swings and misses. So 51 out of 54 of his swings and misses are either in the lower third or out of the zone. So he is able, again, to get people off balance and get people chasing. So I think fantasy-wise, um, clearly he has the command. His command plus um, is 106.4. Um, when he has that change of working, he's going to be pretty, pretty good. I think on nights when he doesn't have it, he may give up more hard contact. Um, there's going to be some regression. I think he's going to keep a one ERA last year. His Sierra is 2.77. But again, I just uh, enjoyed looking into him closer because I think he's someone that I kind of overlooked as a command over control guy. Mm -hmm. um, but I, again, he has a dominant pitch, and I think he deserves to be looked at in that respect. His whiff, his whiff percentage on the changeup this year is 45.3%. Mm -hmm. That's pretty, pretty badass. Yeah. He is one of those pitchers, just like you said, that I, I don't even really think to roster. Mm -hmm. You know, I might, I, might, um, I might think about it if, if he's available at a cheap price. But, yeah, I think we gravitate towards uh, velocity and high strikeout numbers and, and miss pitchers like this quite often. And I think it's really important to evaluate your own biases um, heading into drafts and during the season to make sure that you don't lose out on a pitcher like Pablo Lopez. I think it's a really good point. Yeah, I enjoyed um, that. Who was your pitcher? So my pitcher was Alex uh, Alex Cobb. Okay. I find it fascinating that all of a sudden he's throwing really hard. Um, he's 34 <laughs> years old. Uh, his velocity on his sinker, which is essentially the pitch he throws most, it's his fastball. Um, the velocity on his sinker has increased each of the last four years uh, and in 19, it was 92.3. It's up to 94.4 this year. Um, joining the Giants in, uh, this year, it's increased uh, 1.7 miles an hour. Uh, Alex Cobb is 6'3", 205. He's 34 years old. He signed a two-year, $20 million contract with the Giants this year uh, He's the, with the club option for 24. He was drafted in the fourth round by the Rays. Bit of a journeyman, sinker slider. Uh, or sink or split, I guess, is the best way to put it. Uh, played for Tampa from 11 to 17, Baltimore for three years, and then the Giants or the Angels and then the Giants this year. Um, so this year he's thrown 20.1 innings. He's been a little bit, he, he, I believe, went on the injured list for a little while. He's got 31.5% K rate and a 9% walk rate. So 22.5% K minus BB, which is something that we, don't associate with Alex Cobb, right? Alex Cobb was like a, literally a major league fourth starter, fifth starter on a not very good team. 
Um, and he's never had more than a, a 24.9% K rate. So his K rate is through the roof. I, granted, small sample, 20 innings. But um, if you watch him, it, it doesn't look like it's smoke and mirrors. This looks for real with the added velocity. So I wanted to dig. I wanted to know what happened. Where did he gain this velocity? Why did he do it? And what I found was that uh, he and Alex Wood trained at the same um, at the same place during the pandemic. And Alex Wood started talking to him about driveline. And neither of them were San Francisco Giants at the time. And then, uh, and then Shohei Otani was, was his training partner in Phoenix and recommended it as well. And so Alex Cobb, three years ago, called driveline and started kind of um, essentially listening to their guidance and trying to train um, with some of the driveline principles. And so that's where it's come from, is he's developed a really strong relationship with driveline, like a lot of other pitchers have, and he's added uh, velocity year over year. I found it interesting. So his, um, his split this year, he's throwing 45.6% of the time, and he's throwing his sinker 43% of the time. Mm. And the two pitches have five miles an hour difference. So the split is 89.4 average and the sinker 94.4. The sinker, he's surrendering a 303 average currently, but his XBA is 157. And his X slug is 394, or his, his slug is 394, but the X slug is 197. So the sinker is, which is typically a pitch that you surrender a pretty high average to because of the propensity, obviously, to get ground balls mm -hmm. and ground balls surrender more hits. But the XBA being 157 says a lot about the quality of that pitch, right? And the, the split has similar statistics. They're both, those two pitches have just been dynamite for him. And he's throwing them 90%, almost 90% of the time. His third pitch is his curve. He's throwing it 11.5% of the time. Um, not very good results, but I think he needs to mix in something, obviously, as a third pitch. Uh, so his ground ball rate this year is 67%. Um, previously it was 50, it was 54 in 2021. Um, and everything kind of checks out, right? The top, his topped percentage. So the percentage of balls that are, that, um, the batter hits kind of the top of and hits it into the ground is up 12.3% over last year. He's got more movement on the sinker, even though he's increased the velocity by 1.7 miles an hour. And the vertical movement is the same, but the horizontal movement is, is over an inch more. So he's getting increase in velocity and an increase in horizontal movement on the sinker, which typically an increase in velocity is, um, uh, corresponds with the decrease in vertical and horizontal movement. Uh, and then the split is uh, moving a little bit more vertically and a little less horizontally this year as well. And he scrapped the four seam. So really, um, oh, the, other, other, the other stat that I wanted to share was that his, or his swinging strike rate is at 14% this year, and it's never been higher than 11.2. Um, so he's just basically a better pitcher at age 34. Uh, I sent a tweet to you and, um, well, I tagged you, you and Eno Saris in a tweet a couple hours ago, because I wanted to know, um, what did the Giants do that's different than the, than the standard driveline training that he had right, when he was with uh, the Angels to increase his velocity and make him that much more effective of a pitcher because mm -hmm. he had already um, kind of taken the driveline guidance and become a better pitcher over the last couple of years. But obviously the Giants have some kind of secret sauce with Jacob Junis and even, even Carlos Rodon, the quality of his pitches are better this year than they ever have been. Mm -hmm. what, is, what, is, um, what are the Giants doing to help these pitchers become better? Because Cobb is, you know, when I look at this, I don't think of Alex Cobb as like the number three starter on my fantasy team or have the quality of a number two starter um, in the major leagues. But that's what his profile is reading right now. His mm -hmm. launch angle is negative 2.7 or negative 2.7 degrees. Right. Everything is being either hit into the ground or they're striking out. Right. Yeah. What do you take from what you've seen from Cobb? Have you, have you been able to catch him live on TV? Um, and do you think this is sustainable? Um, I have not been able to see him live. Um, what do I think of it is um, what, from what you shared is that increase in velocity and the increase in vertical movement. 
are two things that with his natural lean towards ground ball and also the, the changing of his pitch mix, which that to me sounds like the giant influence and the data that they're giving them in terms of here's what's working for you. Mm-hmm. Adjusting their velocity. I'll have to share. I heard a podcast with their pitching coach, um, and that I'll send to you. So it sounds like um, you'd be interested in it. Mm-hmm. Just sharing a little bit about their philosophy. He's a former pitcher. I don't remember his name. Uh, but it was quite interesting. Um, yeah, and but in terms of is it sustainable? The, the to me the big question mark is his health. He's always someone that struggled um, to stay healthy. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting too the Giants approach. I've taken on a lot of pitchers that fit that ill of. Like these are high quality pictures that we've seen good things from, um, but all of them came with some health question marks. And um, so that's an interesting organizational approach. They either, they think they can help keep them healthy, which they did last year. They had an older team, they, they kept them healthy. Um, or perhaps is, is there something else that they see? Um, right. So we're gonna take a quick break here. And when we come back, we'll each give a quick uh, hitter and pitcher that are potentially on the wire in a 15 team league and uh, a pitcher and a hitter uh, prospect that we have dug into. We'll be right back. We're back. Uh, So we're gonna talk a little waiver wire. Um, I'll start us off. I'm gonna give the five players that I found on our fan tracks wire. So 16 team league that uh, that I thought were interesting and I would consider picking up if I had a need at the position. And then I'll dig deeply or dig deep into one hitter and one pitcher. So the five that I had were Harrison Bader, Jerickson Profar, Abraham Toro, Yusei Kikuchi, and Will Crow. Um, Bader was just power speed. He's got seven steals already. Uh, you know, he's he had 16 homers and nine steals last year. Could he steal 25 bases this year and hit double digit home runs? I think he can, he can, and he's going to be in the lineup because he's such a good defender. Uh, Profar is hitting the ball harder than he ever has. Um, His launch angle is, is higher or greater than it's ever been. And he's walking at a 15% um, walk rate. So that plus positional or multi-positional as eligibility is reason to keep an eye on Profar. Um, and then the pitcher that I'll mention real quickly is Will Crow. Uh, he's two and two with the save, a hold and a 2.25 ERA. Uh, he's got, so, uh, uh, and he's got SPRP designation, meaning you can slot him into a, a starter role and let him go without disturbing your, uh, your relief core, uh, two victories, a, a save and a hold out like for free, essentially is a pretty big deal. What I did find, however, was that he's, it's a little bit of smoke and mirrors. He's getting a lot of weak contact and his X, not his um, X stats are really good, but I don't know if he's going to be able to sustain it. The two that I'd like to dig a little, go ahead. I saw him pitch live on Monday. He impressed me. Uh-huh. Um, I knew that he had been doing well this year, but this seeing him live, he just has a lot of life on his pitches. He has a great pace and tempo. Um, I just was impressed. I mean, Bednar obviously is one of our favorites and he um, really has a presence, but I would say Crow was pretty close to him nice. in terms of the eye test and just how his pitches moved um, and his confidence and demeanor on the mound. He impressed me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go ahead. The one, the one change, so his velocity has increased each of the last three years. And the interesting thing that I found with him is he's really changed his pitch mix this year. So his... Uh, he threw his change 18.1% of the time last year, and he's thrown it so far this year 32.9% of the time. Um, so that seems to be an effective shift. Uh, the one the one note that, it, one negative note is he's got a 2.25 ERA, but his XFIP is 4.16, and his K minus BB is only 12.2. Um, so the two that I wanna dive a little bit deeper into, Abraham Toro, uh, utility infielder for the Mariners, hitting 150, his OPS is 528. He's got four homers, no stolen bases. Why am I bringing up Abraham Toro, right? Terrible surface stats. Uh, his BABIP is 131, and which I think is, it's gotta be some sort of, of record to have a BABIP that low. Um, his launch angle is a little high for a player that's not a big power player at 18.6 degrees. 
but he's making um, contact in the zone 88% of the time, and his swinging strike rate is only 8.1%. Uh, he's not hitting the ball super hard. He's got an 18, 18th percentile average exit velocity and a ninth percentile hard hit, but his XBA is 50th percentile, and his X slug is 65th, and his barrel is 58th. So according to you know, kind of what you could expect from a player who's done what he's done thus far, he should be um, hitting much better. So his XBA is 255 and his X slug is 409. If you assume he's got an, a batting average of 255 and say a, a, a on base percentage of, I don't know, 340 or so, you're talking about a 760 OPS utility infielder with double digit home runs. Um, so for me, I think you'll see his average go up. He might be like the last player on your fantasy team, but to be able to play the role of, of utility player and um, substitute for a weak second baseman or a weak third baseman at times, there is value in that. And I, I think you can expect his performance to continue to get, to get better. Uh, I was just shocked um, looking, digging deeper that he had such bad luck so far. Uh, he's a player that I know both of us have kept an eye on at times and rostered at times. Yeah. Just looking at roster resource, he's started three times out of the last six days. He started at third, second, and DH. Mm -hmm. That three days in a row, um, which is, I think, ultimate. I know we, you had, we had talked on the pod one day. I'd sent you a message during the draft, like, how often is Toro going to play? And that was my <laughs> my concern is, like, what is his role in this team? Right. Um, yeah. He's uh... – also, we talked about this, I think, a little bit last week, that when you look at how often a team is playing um, a player who's struggling statistically, that says a lot about what the team thinks, right? And Toro continues to, to play, you know, four or five times a week. And I think that's telling as to what the Mariners think about his, his ability. So he's one to watch. If you've got a hole at second, I've even thought about him to replace Colton Wong um, at times. You know, if you've got a hole at second or a hole at third, Toro is definitely someone to that you could pick up on the cheap right now. Uh, real quickly, the, the other player that I wanted to highlight as a potential waiver claim or a wire pickup is Yusei Kikuchi. He's one and one with the 4.15 ERA. His whip is sky high at 1.42. Uh, six starts, 26 innings, 27 Ks. His XFIP is right in line with his ERA. What I, and he's walked 15% of the batters, which is obviously not good. What I like about where he's at is he's getting ground balls 52.2% of the time. And he's, his K rate is, is okay at 23.7, but we talk a lot about a uh, high ground ball rate with a good K rate is usually a good formula for a pitcher, right? Mm -hmm. um, his velocity is similar to the way to what it's been in previous years. I found interesting the Savant comparison based on velo and movement. Two of them were 2021 Robbie Ray and mm -hmm. 2022 Eric Lauer, right? Mm -hmm. Two, one Cy Young award winner and another who's been pitching lights out recently. Yes. Uh, the slider and the cutter have been getting just annihilated. Um, the fastball, forcing fastball has been okay and the changeup has been really good. So if you think about Robbie Ray and some of the change that he made in 2021, it had to do a lot with um, figuring out what breaking ball was gonna work for him, right? And kind of getting him to stop throwing uh, the curveball, and so with Kikuchi, it's, I think there's been some some hiccups up to this point, but we could see him make some of those changes that Robbie Ray made down the road. Um, short and spring training didn't allow the Blue Jays to actually uh, make those changes with him, so he's kind of making them on the fly. So slider is up four miles an hour from where it was last year, and it has 8.1 inches more vertical movement than it did. Um, in 2021, it's gone from being uh, movement being at four o'clock to being at 130. So it's much, much more vertical than it was. Um, to me, if you can be patient and you can roster Kikuchi and maybe even not start him unless you have a really favorable matchup, you might get in the second half of, of uh, the season a really, really dynamite starter. I think there's a lot of potential there. Mm. No, I love that. I watched a little bit of him. Uh, I don't remember what day it was. This week looks like on his game log it was the 10th so mm -hmm. four days ago against the Yankees mm -hmm. um, he went five and a third he got two and runs seven K's three walks um, there was an inning where he kind of lost it command wise but he got out of it 
Um, yeah, I heard uh, Sleeper and the Bus were talking about Kuhuchi and they were talking about his schedule, which I don't roster him and I didn't realize this. His schedule to start the year was at the Yankees, at the Red Sox, at Houston versus Houston versus the Yankees at the Yankees. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you look to me, you take his surface level results so far with a grain of salt. Um, the Yankees, you know, he's played the Yankees three times. They're a very patient team. It's not a great matchup for him because of his tendency to have wavering command. You got the, the, uh, the Astros twice, which are one of the better play discipline teams as well. So, yeah, I love what you shared. And to me, he's – I honestly did not know he was available, and then he got cut. Mm -hmm. um, and he's very intriguing based on that. Mm -hmm. I'm also rooting for him just as a former Mariner. I, I want to see him yeah. succeed. Yep. I'm 100% with you on that. How about your uh, some of your waiver guys? Yeah, so I have three number two hitters. Um, and we talked about lineup position and what that means. I think all these guys to put on your last spot on your team – uh, depending on what you need, and they're all batting in the number two spot. And uh, on your respective teams, you got Michael Brantley, um, great play skills, 12 walks, 15 strikeouts, the slash line 275, 347, 404, 751 OPS. So you're not giving too much back there. Um, bats second for Houston every day as a fourth outfielder. I think if you need if you need hits, you need runs. I think that's a great add. Profar, who you mentioned, again, 20 walks, 22 strikeouts. Uh, great play discipline is slash line 188, 313, 402. Um, but he's driving in a lot of runs as a 715, 715 OPS and is playing every day at number two. Brandon Drury for the Reds uh, is like mm -hmm. quad eligible. If you need more power, he's uh, slash line 260, 339, 563. Um, he's never slash 563 before, but it's a great park and he's going to come back a little bit, but he does have a history of plus power mm -hmm. um, or a good power in his bat. Um, so, again, with that eligibility in the Reds' ballpark, to me, you could do a lot worse as the last player on your bench to slide in where you need him. Um, and then two pitchers, one starter, uh, Chase Silseth for the Angels, debuted last night, um, gave up no hits – or, excuse me, no runs, 10 swings and misses, set 96-97. Um, he was picked up on our league last night. Um, but other leagues, I think he might be worth a look. He looks like he might stay up for a little while. Um, and then if you need saves, Felix Batista for the Orioles – he got the opportunity to close while um, Jorge Lopez was on paternity or um, bereavement mm -hmm. and looked really good in the role. His 16, his KWB is 16 to five right now. Uh, thus far, uh, so very hard um, and showed good command in the ninth inning. So the Orioles have shown they're not afraid to be fluid in the bullpen. So while Jorge Lopez has also been really good after having a rough start, um, he's, he was good before he went on leave. I wouldn't be surprised to see those guys mix and match. And when Bautista isn't in the ninth, um, you know, he's, he's has good ratios. He could potentially help you there. So mm -hmm. it's interesting to me because when, you know, when they chase, when they traded Sulcer and uh, Sulcer and uh, Tanner Scott right near the end of camp, a lot of us thought like, wow, they're just, they really are punting, but those guys have proved to be not that great with the Marlins. The Marlins bullpen is, is, pretty dreadful while the Orioles open has actually been quite good. Right. And you also look at their starters, um, uh, Tyler Wells. Um, and then they have a couple other starters whose names I'm just Zim Zim Zimmerman's been pretty good. Zimmerman's been good. Mm -hmm. And then someone else who was picked up in our league this week, I was looking at. So I think there's some interesting pitching development things going on in Baltimore. Uh -huh. um, the fact that they're having these guys pop up. Um, and really good being good at the end of games and really looking at roles differently, moving Tyler Wells to a starting role. Um, I just think there's some interesting things going on in Baltimore. So they seem to call up Adley and, and get on it. Um, yeah, I'd be interested. Race in too, right? Yeah. Well, so I, was, I was distracted with uh, the Ump Show not giving uh, Jesse Winker ball four that was in a ball that was clearly inside Mariners Mets. Um, do you have time to do a couple of prospects real quick? Yeah, let's keep rolling. Sweet. So I've got a list of prospects that I just found interesting and I wanted to dig a little bit and then I'll go into two of them. Uh, Jackson Job, 19-year-old uh, right-handed starter, uh, picked third overall by Detroit in 2021. Uh, number 38 prospect by MLB and 49 baseball prospectus. Interesting thing about him is his slider spin is at 19 years old is over 3,000. 
Um, and he'd be heading into a good park with uh, potentially some good players uh, in a couple of years. But he's a, a big, big, big up and comer. Um, I have Edward Cabrera on the list. We talked about him yesterday. Matt Liberatore, who I'll dig into a little bit later. Uh, Emerson Hancock, 23 years old, picked six overall by the Mariners in 2020. He's actually making his debut on Saturday. Um, so he's coming back. They've kind of been uh, babying his shoulder quite a bit. Uh, Mick Abel, 20 years old, picked 15th overall by Philadelphia in 2020. Athletic 6'5", really, really good stuff. Um, keep an eye on him. And then Andrew Painter, who they picked in the first round, the Phillies right behind or well, the next year after Abel. 19 years old, 13th overall. Uh, funny thing about Painter, a ball this year, five starts, 20 innings, eight hits, seven walks, 40 strikeouts. So he's got two strikeouts an inning, 52.6% K, uh, K rate right now. Six, seven repeats his delivery. Uh, with Abel and Painter, I, I hesitate because of the park. And I hesitate because if they're up within the next couple of years, um, the defense is atrocious right now and could eat them alive, but both really great starters. Then two hitters I have are J.J. Bladé uh, with the Marlins, picked fourth overall in 2019, and Joey Weimer, who's 23 years old, fourth round pick by Milwaukee in 2020. Um, those are all players I just kind of have an eye on that I find interesting. Libertor is the one I want to dig into. 22, left-handed, hand, left -handed, uh, in the Cardinals organization. He was the 16th overall pick by the Rays in 2018. MLB Pipeline had him at number 41. Baseball Prospectus at 65. He's not spectacular. He's actually had 55s across the board with pipeline, fastball, slider, curve, change, control, and future value. Uh, Curveball is probably his best pitch. But this is an example of why context really matters. Um, you know, the current fifth starter in St. Louis is not very good, right? They're, they're rolling. Uh, uh, what's that? Uh, Dakota Hudson, kind of those types of starters out there. And Libertor has, while he doesn't have the highest ceiling of pitching prospects, he's a much better prospect than any, any of the guys they really have going right now. Um, so he's, he has opportunity as the number five pretty soon in St. Louis. He doesn't walk very many batters at all. Um, he does give up quite a bit of contact, but given the defense in the park, I think that, you know, that formula of great defense, big park, not walking a lot of batters can really elevate your statistics, even if you're not a great pitcher. Uh, in seven starts in AAA so far as 40 innings, 36 hits, 12 walks, and 46 Ks. Um, I think you're going to see him rostered in most leagues within the next couple of weeks. Uh, talk is that he could be up pretty soon. And I actually wouldn't be surprised to see him outperform his ability and be someone who uh, who is a pretty decent fantasy starter, even at the end of this year. Um, so he's one to keep an eye on, even if his ceiling isn't that high. The other one is J.J. Bladé, because he was a, a pretty big deal um, the la last couple of years, prospect-wise. He's now 24. Uh, in AAA so far, he has six home runs and 130. 39 plate appearances and he's got a 17 percent walk rate but he's only hitting 223 uh i think the marlins are at a place where they're going to want to see what he can do pretty soon uh he might be worth a gamble if you have a spot on at the end of your roster because he does have pedigree right he played at vanderbilt he's the fourth overall pick he has a really pretty left-handed swing and it wouldn't surprise anyone for him to come up and hit 270 or 280 and be like a 270, 25 home run type of player, um, kind of out of the blue. So JJ Bladé is start, may, might be starting to round into form a little bit, but he's someone to keep an eye on as well. What do you have prospect wise? You see the write up um, that Eno did about the PCL pitchers that uh, Libertor was a part of? I did, actually. Yeah. I did. I wish yeah. I could have had all the metrics that he got his hands on with PCL, but that's, a, that's another story and see it um but yeah is uh yeah, i feel like he's he's been in the news cycle a lot this week i've heard him mention on a couple other pods as well um, i actually so i drafted him interestingly yeah. i drafted him with one of my last picks in our draft and ended up cutting him because i thought he might have opportunity yeah that sounds like it's going to be come to fruition i have a couple things prospect wise one i wanted to check in on 
the Minnesota prospects as we talked about them. Mm -hmm. um, just Miranda and Royce Lewis, specifically with us in TGFBI, we were able to get Royce Lewis on a low bid because we there was, I think our league mates obviously thought he was going to be sent back down. I think I was, uh, we were concerned about that as well. Uh, so far, a small sample, Miranda is 128, 171, 256 slash line. Royce is 320, 320, 520. Uh, he had a grand slam last night, his first mm -hmm. big um, he has four strikeouts and no walks, um, 840 OPS, and already had two hard hit balls. His home run last night was 114 miles off the bat, which is uh, pretty impressive. Um, was Miranda is five strikeouts, two walks, um, 427 OPS, um, but obviously has a lower K rate. So, yeah, just interesting to see as they get guys coming. I know Larnack's going to be back soon. Corey will be coming off the DL early next week. Uh, one of these guys is probably going down. Uh, it's just going to be really interesting to see how that goes. I wanted to check on that. And then I wanted to highlight uh, Jordan Walker as a high performer. He was someone we were really on in the preseason. Um, I wanted to give you props for that. It, he's a 19 in double A um, through 28 games. He's batting 327 with three home runs, 10 steals, and 943 OPS, despite being, despite being two or three years younger than most guys at that level. Um, he had a really aggressive assignment to be in double A and he's crushing the ball. Um, his Cato BB was, he says 28 strikeouts and 17 walks this year. Last year he had 87 strikeouts and 33 walks. So he is really uh, showing uh, increased plate discipline and awareness despite uh, going up a level. So I just want to highlight him. He and Yuri Perez are two 19 year olds at double A who are excelling despite being really young for the level. Um, so I wanted to highlight him as someone who just uh, seems like is on the charge. Mm -hmm. and the last thing I had prospect wise is I was reading a pipeline article, which I don't think their content is great, but mm -hmm. they just had to, uh, recently they announced a top five um, kind of mock draft of upcoming next month's draft. Um, they had uh, Drew Jones one, Elijah Green two, Tamar Johnson three, Jackson Holiday fourth, and Brooks Lee five. Um, I thought it was interesting that three of these five players are already on rosters in our dynasty league. Mm -hmm. um, so as interesting to me that two of them were not. Um, and just, yeah, that we could have a discussion, maybe a later date of like the strategy around getting these guys before they're drafted sure. um, before in the new cycle. Um, and you have, you have a uh, Tamar Johnson. Um, and Cam Collier as well. Yeah. And Cam Collier was 17 on that list farther mm -hmm. down. I noted that as well. Um, and then Ken, uh, our pro prospect hound, uh, has Drew Jones. He took, he actually drafted him in the seventh round in our, our redraft this year. Mm -hmm. And then I picked up Brooks Lee this week, who's a um, out of Cal Poly. He's 21, switch hitting infielder, um, has a 65 grade on a sit tool uh, with plus power as well. Um, could be the most advanced bat coming out of college. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just interesting um, approach strategy wise. I wanted to call that out again. I thought it was interesting that three of those players are already on uh, rosters in our league. Right. Yeah. I took uh Termar in the sixth uh, over Jones. I think Jones is, is from fantasy wise is a little less valuable in that, you know, a lot of his value major league major league value is predicated on his defense in playing center field. Um, I also had just had to roster the player that they're calling the black weight Boggs. I'm sorry. So he's basically black weight Boggs with power. And I got caught up watching YouTube videos of, of uh, Tamar Johnson and Cam Collier. And I don't know, that's, I fall in love with players that way sometimes. Yeah. And. Well, uh, Ken's been transparent to me. Like he loves, he loves guys who add value with the glove and, uh, and maybe overvalue them, but like, that's the profile that he likes. So. Right. One well, and Collier is he's actually number two. Keith Law, I don't love Keith Law's rankings all the time either, but Law had him number two. Oh, and, really? Uh huh. And Collier is and yeah. Luke Collier's son. Okay, yeah. And he's seventeen, playing in or playing uh, junior college ball, and is just he's killing junior college at seventeen years old. So if you're a believer in age, um playing a, a big role in, in uh, prediction as far as a player's ability, Collier is one of those. And he's probably going to stay at third. So if he stays at third, he's already hitting at 17 years old. He's got major league pedigree as far as his, his uh, lineage. Um, he was a player that I wanted to roster. And I, I thought long and hard about him or Christian Baccaro and decided Collier was the one I wanted. That's awesome. But yeah, it's, uh, it's fun, man. It's, it's, 
I've got lots more to share as far as maybe we'll come visit the prospect chatter next Saturday. I've got lots more to share about the players that I mentioned. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a fun week. I'm watching uh, George Kirby against Chris Bassett right now. How's Kirby doing so far? He's just one hitter. He's fine. He's just threw a 98 mile an hour fastball to Starling Marte that he couldn't catch up to. So he's doing all right. Cool. Awesome. Well, this was fun, man. Yeah. Thanks for the talk to you. It was much needed. Have we'll a good talk night. Tuesday. You too, brother.